We are certainly living in unprecedented times with a local election and the COVID-19 virus putting a halt to live entertainment and music all around the world. I thought we'd bring the entertainment to you. And I'm joined today by former Noosa and Sunshine Coast Mayor, Mr. Bob Abbott. Welcome, Bob. Thanks, Matt. Welcome to my backyard. This is uh, a wonderful place. You and uh, little Gypsy, she's around here somewhere. Yeah, she's hiding now. She's the camera shy. She's running around. Yeah. Now, uh, Bob, thanks for your time today. Lots of stuff I want to talk to you about. Life, music, politics, uh, and you've even got your harmonica. We might be able to get a couple of tunes out of you at some point. We'll see what happens with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But Bob, but take me right back to school days, mate. You left school in grade 10. Yeah. What, what was the goal? Oh, well, it, you know, in those days, everybody left a grade 10, basically. There was 10 or 12 grade 10 classes at Mitchelton High School, and um, the following year, there was two grade 12, grade 11. So, I mean, that's oh. the way it was. Um, yeah, I had an opportunity to get an electrical apprenticeship, and I did that. And, and it took me to a lot of places around, you know, Queensland and around the country. It's sort of... Yeah, it was good for me, you know, and, but there was never really any great ambition and there's no, nothing about politics in my life then, even though I was, you know, I was a union delegate in a workshop that I worked with at times. I had fairly significant interest in state and local politics in the old days, but there was never any thought about me being involved in any of that or well, playing music for that matter. Exactly. Well, is, is it okay if I mention that, that during your school days, and not that you knew this, but you had a... Uh, a level of dyslexia? Yeah, I don't look, I've only worked that out in the last sort of eight or ten years, mate. I, <laughs> I could never, you know, people say, oh, did, have you read something, you read such and such a book or anything? No, I'd have to say no because I hadn't. And I only realised that um, later in life, the reason I hadn't read a lot of stuff was because I struggled to read a lot of stuff. I could read well, I, you know, my English was good. When it, English was one of the four was one of the four out of the eight subjects I managed to pass in grade 10. Um, so there was nothing wrong with any of that. I did learn, I learned well. I, um, you know, early in the piece, I was always at the top of my class in my early years. And I suppose then in the latter years when you got, had to learn more detail, I slipped down to the back row. But um, yeah, look, at the end of the day, I just realized that I struggled to read a lot of information. I mm. I get to the second or the third page of something important and it just goes fuzzy, you know. So uh, there'll be a lot of people out there that understand that. Oh, I can relate. Um, I'm one of them. Oh, yeah. yeah? Oh, there you go. Good on there. A journalist and a politician that can't read. That's just what we need. This interview will go well. Now, um, talking about politics, when did you think this is a world you want to get into? Um, look, I... I don't know if we ever made that decision. Um, when we came to um, you know, what I call my noosa, I mean, I, when I got married, I, my wife and I already had a property at Coran. Uh, she bred horses and dogs, and, and I was an electrical contractor and thought, you know, New Horizons up here, I could get work up here and do all that sort of stuff, so we moved up here. Um, and a number of things happened. The local show was falling over in Pomona. And, um, I'd had years involved in clubs and that sort of thing in, in Brisbane. My parents were that sort of people. And I was you know, obviously involved in my sister's planning club and football clubs of my own and all that sort of stuff on committees and stuff. So end up, you know, we went to a meeting one night just to see what was going to happen to the show because it was failing. And I walked in as an unknown and walked out as president. So um, <laughs> it often happens that yeah, way. Yeah. <laughs> um, so someone pointed, he's got a lot to say. What about him? So uh, yeah, that's where I ended up. And so president of the show society. Um, and then we did such a good job that first year with the show society. Um, someone says, oh, there's an election coming up soon. What about that? Mm. Oh, no, 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 no. And all of why? Sudden, why did you say no initially? Oh, I was too busy doing other stuff, man. Yeah. You know, it was something I'd planned to do. Um, and there was a casual vacancy come up in the council. One of the old councillors retired and, you know, we talked about, oh, we'll see how we go. I mean, I might be able to do three or four months and see if I like it. And, you know, if not, I can bail out and it's all done. Mm. And um, so I put my hand up for that. And in those days, it was the council that elected the new member. And there was, there was 11 councillors plus the mayor. And I walked in and I gave my speech and thought I was pretty bloody good and it lost at 11-2. 
<laughs> and I thought, oh, I didn't realise I was quite that. Oh, you were good at speeches, Mike. Until one of the two said to me, "You were done over, mate. It was set up before you started." Uh, so I got me back up, didn't I? Right. And I stood at the next election the five months later and won it, and the rest is history, as they say. That getting your back up, and then, you know going full 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 on for for the for the, for the greater cause would that be fair to say that was always how you were with politics yeah look i think that's what happened in the, like the reason i got my back it wasn't just about me it was said hang on this these people fair. are manipulating the system for mm. themselves it's not <clears throat> and it turned out later it wasn't a, wasn't about themselves it was about party politics but mm. um i just said no <laughs> no no, why? Why should I? You know, okay. I'd never let that happen in my life before, and neither had my parents. Um, and they were always willing to stand up and do the work, and so was I at the time. So, yeah, I thought, fair enough, um, away we go. And, you know, I got myself elected in 1982, which turned out to be probably the Watershed Council for Noosa. It was, uh, you know, all the, the big hitters were there, Michael Gloucester, Peter Bycroft, Noel Playford, Val Smart. Um, Toss Barnett, you know, they were all there. This mm. whole team of really well-educated, high-profile people that had a particular vision in mind. And poor old me that was more worried about the potholes at, you know, in Kinkin and Coran <laughs> than, than anything else. And I, and I thought a town plan was something you bought from the service station to find out how to get from one place to another. So that's how much I knew about what yeah. I was doing. But by the end of that term... Um, and we didn't do an apprenticeship in that term. We were blooded. It was simple as that. Right it, was, it was a blood sport. It was because it was a whole change of dynamic from, from the old style council that, you know, were considering things like um, development on the spit, high rise buildings and Hastings Street and all that sort of stuff mm. to a council that said, no, we're not doing any of that. Mm. We, we want this place protected environmentally, socially um, and commercially. We, we don't want that to happen to where, where we live. So I had three years of, very steep learning curve and there we are you know a, a lot of people that, that watch this might not know much about Noosa's de-amalgamation from the Sunshine Coast Council can you paint a bit of a picture of just how um, intense that time was yeah look the, <laughs> it was a time where excuse my expression but it was just the greatest shit fight of all time <laughs> Um, There's a the headline, Bob, to this. Yeah, that's a headline. Well, that's what it was. <clears throat> we'd been done over in no uncertain times. A decision, in my view, and in the view of many others, had been made long before any public pronouncements were made that they were going to make this super council on the Sunshine Coast, um, and it was going to design to take a significant amount of pressure off the city of Brisbane and blah, 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 and all the rest of that stuff. Um, and the people of Noosa genuinely got their nose out of joint because they'd just spent probably, well, from 1982 to 2007, developing a picture all of their own. Um, you know, a, a place that wasn't any better, in my view, than anywhere else. It was just different. It was what we wanted, not what everyone else wanted. And all of a sudden, we had this government forcing the people of Noosa to do what everyone else was doing. So. The flag went up and so did the hairs on the back of the neck and from then on it was it was just full on you know mm. i was i ran two really big campaigns in my life and that was one of them um and the second one was the sunshine coast regional council election we'll talk about that later but um it was just a massive campaign and i think the culmination of that what said the most about what this community was thinking and capable of the time we actually organised a trip to Brisbane to do a march in Brisbane. And we invited other councils from around the state that were involved in, you know, their, their own local issues. Um, and there were 10,000 people marched in George Street on that day. And you, and you led that march? I did. <clears throat> 9,000 of them came from Noosa. <laughs> I'm not joking. That's we a were big carry, bus, We were carrying old people onto buses. They demanded to go. Mm. We were doing all sorts of stuff. And the interesting thing was, while all that stuff was happening, I was actually in hospital. I'd oh. had, a, I'd had a, a bit of a problem four right? or five uh, days earlier. Um, and um, the doctor said he wasn't gonna let me go because I might have a heart attack or something. And another doctor walked in and said, don't worry about it, he hasn't got a heart, let him go anyway. <laughs> um, so he knew you well then. <laughs> I, I arrived at, at the South Bank thing in a car. 
um, they whisked me out of the back of the car up to the, <coughs> the grandstand. We did all the cheering and yelling and ranting and raving you see on the videos and then speared me straight back into the car and drove me around to George Street. <laughs> so it all looked good, but the people, they, they wouldn't care if I come down to the spaceship. You know, well, that. I was going to say, does all that ranting and raving actually help the cause? It, look, what it did was just show the world what Noosa was capable of. <clears throat> we didn't win that one. We certainly won the next one. Mm. And the next one was built on the strength of the first one. You know, the next one was far more, um, uh, I suppose, elegant, and far more structured. They had a lot longer to do it. They had, you know, four and a half years to actually develop that sort of concept to build up all that framework. But the blood and sweat came from the first campaign and the memories retained from that first mm -hmm. campaign certainly dragged them through at the end. So, Help me out with the timeline because once Noosa was its own separate council, you, you weren't mayor immediately? Um, what, the first time? What, once, once Noosa went back to its own council? No, 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 no. I've not been mayor of the new Noosa council ever. Um, in 2008, we got <coughs> amalgamated. In 2012, when I was, uh, in 2008, we got amalgamated. I won the campaign for the Sunshine Coast mayoralty. In 2012, I retired. In 2014, the campaign to de-amalgamate was successful. Noel Playford was elected mayor of the first council um, and I was elected as a councillor. I put my hand up as a councillor right. to just try and help rebuild what we had um, and take my experience to the board. You know, like you know, I thought it was valuable. Um, people thought so um, and put me back there. And then in 2016, after that short term, I retired again and got, got out of the way. You know, that's when Tony was elected and, and the rest is history, as they say. Uh, you, you mentioned the Sunshine Coast Council before. Let's talk about that. W what were the biggest differences as mayor that you noticed from Sunshine Coast to Noosa? Look, in the end, with the result we got, the differences were in the attitude of the councils as against the attitude of the communities. Um, there was a lot of bagging of Noosa in the old days. You know, who do they think they are? They <coughs> think they're special, all that sort of stuff. And it still goes on today. Mm. But that wasn't the reality with Noosa. What you had with Noosa was a group of people in our community that really cared about where they lived. And they, they wanted their environment to be protected. They wanted to have good spaces for kids to, to play. They wanted to have that, um, you know, not the trappings of city life in the place that they've chosen to live in. Um, and one of the things that I always used to say, that one of the reasons that really spurred me on to do the things that I did, is I wanted my kids to be able to catch, my grandkids to be able to catch in the noose, a fish in the Noosa River the same way as I did. Well, that's still possible. So, and that's the sort of stuff that I found as I was doing my campaign, the black and white campaign in 2008, but that's what people at Namble wanted too, and that's what people at Maritida wanted, and Calandra and Bewa and all that. But people wanted it. Yeah. That's why they said, you know, come on, let's, why can't we have this stuff? We know we need, we've got this, and we know we've got that, we know we've got this development, we know our plans, town plans do this and that. But they said, why do you think we're fighting so hard and spending all this money in, in, in community campaigns to stop? developers ripping and tearing and busting our community when you guys are doing it up there on your own. You know? right. Why do you think that's happening down here? Because you didn't have that sort of protection. So I got very much enthused about what they were telling me. Um, and there were, you know, there were other people saying, you've got no chance, Bob, you've got no chance. But um, <laughs> and I listened to the people in the street. It's always been my message. It's always been my telephone. Yeah. Um, and they, they just said to me, that we want some of that. We want some of that protection. We want, we want to be able to do that and go out and know that um, we can have some confidence in the people around us that are looking after our, our best wishes in the way we want it rather than, you know, from some other perspective. And, you know, the proof was in the pudding. 73% of the primary vote. Bang. You know, excuse <laughs> me. But, um, look, I could have won the second one too, but I had enough. I was, mm. oh, what was I, 64 or something like that. And... And I was wearing out. It had been the hardest four years of my life, honestly. It was, it was a tough gig. Mm. It was a tough gig. Um, and there's a lot of stuff I'll never ever talk about again that, that happened to me, you know, threats and stuff that, that I had to, go, had to go through. And that didn't stop me at the end. But in the end, I was just worn out. It was 30 years of 
hard slog with the last four being the worst. So it was time to go. It's it's a thankless job being a politician. What would you say was the, the, the thing that continued to get you up every morning and, and really have that passion for it? <laughs> this is a great question. I asked this one, I answered it once with a simple equation. The thing that gets you up and doing it every day is every now and then someone says thank you. <laughs> it's what it is. Wow. Every now and then someone says thank you. And you got no idea. And you just said it was a thankless job. To a great degree it is. But sometimes when you can affect somebody's like life in that way, that they'll come and say thank you for that. Mm. It's a it's a powerful thing, and it's I know it motivates a lot of councillors um, throughout the state. I mean, councillors like you say they they get a ribbing, they get a flogging from the press, and you know they're they're fair game to a lot of journalists and that sort of stuff because. They really don't have a lot of defensive mechanisms built in around them like the state politicians. They're not mm. protected like the federal politicians. So they're out there. They're next to the <clears throat> next door to the journalists. They're next door to the people. And they just get belted because they can. But 99% of them, not all of them as we've seen in the last term, not all of them, but 99% of them are just good, hard-working people wanting to do the sort of stuff that I want to do as well. So you know, I'm always there to defend them and I always will because I know what they're like. And I, I just I just think, you know, they're the same as me. Every now and then someone says thank you and it, it makes it all worth it. Uh, just finish with the local election, Bob. Tony Wellington out, first Noosa female mayor in Claire Stewart in, um, but really close. Did you see that coming? Um, look, I reckon it was going to be close and the nearer we got to the election, the more it was looking that way. Um, and obviously that's, yeah, you respond to a lot of the campaigning that's going on and, and Claire certainly had committed to a good campaign and a, an, an obvious campaign and I, I, I can't knock her for that. I, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> I did it um, many times, the, the last time being the most, of, you know, that. Can you be an incumbent and get in without spending a lot of money, do you think? Oh, sorry, start again. Can you, can you not be an incumbent spend and, and, and get in without spending a lot of money? Look, let's put it this way. If, if the incumbent's been there for 40 years and you know, lost a lot of faith and you're Elvis Presley, yes. <laughs> but if you don't build a profile and you don't let people know who and, who and what you are, no, it's not gonna happen. You know, um, there's an old saying in politics that Oppositions don't win government, governments lose it. And that's the case. And nine times out of 10, you will get that situation where it'll be a wider gap than what this election's been. But with this election, it was so narrow. There were, um, you know, it's probably the campaign that, that was run. Um, the investment in the campaign showed the difference. And it was so close. I, if, from my perspective, um, and bringing a bit of Bob wisdom, I suppose, to the front. Um, if I were Claire, I'd be saying, well, there's still a lot of people out there that want those old ways. 50% almost. How yeah. can I ma manage that mm. by still getting the things in that I think are important to me um, and bringing us all forward together? That's, that's her challenge now, to, to work out how... I think she's capable of it. Uh, a lot of other people in Noosa think she's capable of it. Um, Tony's approach was different to hers and, and what the community got were two clear, concise mm. um, campaigns that showing what and what they wanted to do. One had experience, one didn't. I just think that's, that's, that's politics. We've got to get on with it. But I think the message is there for the current mayor that don't write off those mm. people. Don't forget who put you there is my, is my mantra. Um, and I've said that to many, many mayors who I've mentored over the years. That you never forget who put you there because they're the ones that will put you back out again. That's right. Staying with that Bob wisdom from the Sunshine Coast Council perspective, Mark Jameson in for another term. Is he doing a good job as far as you're concerned? Look, I, I haven't watched what <coughs> Mark's done. I mean, a lot of the things that he's brought forward, the, um, you know, the, the Marucci Town Centre thing, um, the international airport stuff, that's all stuff that's come through from 
from my council and even the airport stuff came from, from Joe Natale before me. Um, so Mark's carried that through really well and he's done a great job. He's got, um, I think he's listed some very good advice about some of his environmental stuff. He's done some really good environmental stuff. I'm, I was a bit, um, what would you say, how's your father about the, about the, um, you know, the sun farm, the power <laughs> farm up over mm -hmm. there? Solar farm. Well, I reckon that's, you know, it's just in hindsight. They've done a great job and he had confidence in that. So I look, it's, it's nothing really that he's doing that I can knock, but I don't see it every day. I only see the, the periphery stuff, you know, probably the good stuff that I see. Um, so, but, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, um, I think he's doing a reasonable sort of a job from what I can see. I'm wary about talking about too much politics. So I've got one more question for you. Of the decades and decades that you spent in council is there one thing that you didn't do is there one thing i didn't do that you wish you could have done um <clears throat> or is there one big regret no there's there's no regrets for me um what i did i did because i i wanted to make it happen um, and I used all my sort of leadership skills that I could muster to make it happen. I was very lucky. I was surrounded by very good people, both elected people and staff. I had a, um, a philosophy on leadership that worked in well at the time, you know. Um, I, I suppose if there was one thing I didn't do that I could have done, that I had I kept going into politics, I... I would have been able to achieve, and that was to become the president of the local government association. I was senior vice president tw two terms in a row. I could have come become the um, yeah, the president of that, but I had to be a, an elected member to do that. And I chose in 2016 to call it a day. Mm. You know, and sometimes you just got to do that. You just you can hang around for too long. One of one of my mentors or my I had a couple of very good mentors, but one of them was Tommy Burns, the great Tommy Burns, probably one of the most likable characters ever to, to tread Queensland politics. Yeah. And um, I'd known him for a very long time before even I got in, into politics. And he once said to me, there's two things you've got to understand about politics, Bob. One is that you never underestimate your electorate. They know more about what you're doing than you think they're doing. And the other one is you've got to go when they want you to stay rather than stay until they want you to go. And I reckon I'd earn my stripes. I reckon I'd, I could walk away from the job at that time, not needing to prove anything. And if I could have spent another four years, I could have put a black mark on my career. Mm. I may not have, I may have, may not have, but <clears throat> I just made a conscious decision, it's time. And I, I think, thanks Tommy, and I walked away. And I walked away when you know, people might have wanted me to stay, mm. um, but it was time for me to go. And that was the, that was the decision I made. And I, I said from day one, I remember saying to my wife in the very early stages, I, I could not be one of these people that was voting into my spot on a minority. It's not something that I could handle if, if less than 50% of the people didn't want me there. So... I just said, it's enough, mm. enough, walk away, and, and I did. And there's no regrets about not being the president of the Local Government Association, but it's the, probably the one thing that I could have done that I didn't. That one box. That, that, that one box, ticked. that's that one <coughs> tick, yeah. Okay. And I don't mind talking about politics, mate. It took 30 years of my life. <laughs> that's, right. that's where all my stories are, <laughs> or most of them. Bob, they say behind every great man is an even greater woman. Um, your part, your long-term partner Sue sadly passed away recently. Must have been a tough time for you and the family. Yeah, look, it was, mate. Um, you know, she had a great, she had a great way of doing things, and she's made my journey away from her um, a lot easier by the things she set in motion while she was here. And you know, in um, I had a couple of people here today doing a bit of a reminisce, a couple of her students, and um, yeah, I mean, she used to tell me. You know, you can't wait till I die because the women are going to be lining up at the gate. <laughs> well, you know, it hasn't happened, Sue. You know, but um, look, yeah, she had a great sort of view of the world and what's happening. And, um, you know, the anniversary, the first anniversary of their death, her death is next week. But I'm looking at it as, you know, it's just a milestone. It's something 
we all need to go through, you know, unfortunately, um, we'll die at some time in our life. Um, but when she left, she left a great legacy in me, uh, in my family, people around me, her own family. Um, and, and this, what you see, she created this, uh, this was her, um, pride and joy. And she walk out on this, on this deck and this veranda and, and see spot. all the screening. It's a great spot. So, yeah, it's a, it's look, this is what I can enjoy every day. This is what I see of Sue now. And if I can't get any better than that, it's fine. You're doing all right. Yeah. Um, you're, you've proven yourself a very resilient man. How tough was it for you once, once Sue passed? Um, little things made a difference. It, it, honestly, um, I had a situation where the first morning I couldn't work out what was wrong. I knew she wasn't there. I knew she was dead and she wasn't coming back. Yeah. But what, what's that one thing of that morning that I remember most of all? The radio wasn't on. Because the first thing she did every morning when she got turn out of bed was turn on. the radio on. And I turned the radio on and things got better, you yeah. know. A couple of days later, sitting out on the deck here having breakfast, that feeling came back. There's something missing. What's missing? I know it's Sue. I know she's dead. I know she's not coming back. But what's missing? Mosquito mm -hmm. coil underneath the table, you know. There's a lot of mosquitoes in this rainforest stuff. Every morning, the second thing she did was light a mosquito coil and put it on yeah. the table. So it's all those little things that make a difference. Yeah. Everyone grieves differently. And I've had people say to me, you know, you don't look like you're grieving. Well, what does grieving look like, you know? I've got a big hole burning in here, <laughs> but i got some beautiful memories, yeah. you know? So what am I gonna, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna sort of let that eat me away? Yes, it is internally, but outside, um, I can get on with my life knowing fully that she's still around, that those things are still happening, that, um, you know, she's up there somewhere looking at me, watching, telling me what's going on. But, you know, man, if you don't, if you don't get on with life, you might as well go yourself. It's that's not what you I would say. have wanted either, though. Absolutely, and that's the conversation we had this morning, you know, the sort of four of us sitting around the table dribbling and um, talking about, all those things and then you know all of us said at some time it's not what she would have wanted you know what happened this morning was just a bit of fun and you know a bit of a reminiscing yeah you can have a cry but at the end of the day you can't cry forever and i i sort of um, i've made myself some benchmarks and next week next week's one of them but the, in that six months i tried to come to grips with what it is that was irking me about it all and I realised and I said to somebody, look, I can never forget her. I can never forget. I won't ever forget. But time's making the remembering easier. So I can remember things now that don't affect me anymore. They make, they make me feel good rather than depress me. So, yeah, look, as time goes on, it gets better. And hundreds of people have told me that because I, I all of a sudden worked out I'm not the first one that someone's ever died on, if you know what I mean. <laughs> That's true, yeah, look. In moments like that, do you, besides family obviously there to support you, do, do you realise who your true friends are? Yeah, absolutely. And it's one of the discussions we had this morning is you do know um, who your true friends are and purely and simply by the, the simple things they do, not by the great exposés of crying or you know, dancing or whatever you're doing. It's simple things, absolutely simple things. Just, um, g'day, there you go, what's happening, you know? Yeah, yeah, pick up the phone, yeah. And it's nothing, nothing to do with reams of flowers or cards or anything like that. I mean, if you can't get to see someone, a lovely card with a simple thought, by all means. But it's just the simple things that make a difference, for me anyway. I mean. Other people may need different, but that's all, that's all I needed. Um, and those who meant something to me did that. Did that for you and, yeah. and the family. Bob, let's turn the page and talk about one of your other passions in music. And uh, I've seen you many a time on the stage, rocking out. And it's hard to think, and I'll say to my friends, that's the, that's the Noosa Mare there. And they'll think, no, <laughs> surely not. D do you get to become someone else when you're on stage, do you think? Yeah, look, I think that's what happened to me. Um, I mean, music's always been something special to me. I, you know, I did all the stuff in the 60s that people did in the 60s and the 70s with music. I, 
my first album was um, Jerry and the Pacemakers and, you know, Ferry Across the Mersey and Never Walk Alone, all those sorts of songs that, you know, are quite famous now. They all meant stuff to you, you know, and uh, Never Walk Alone, that's become the, you know, the, the soccer theme song, I suppose. And, but it's a great song to sing. And when I was a young bloke, I had a reasonable voice and you'd sing that at parties out loud. And, you know, so that sort of, I had that memories. Holly's, you know, and Heavy Head, my brother. It's another one, you know, you'd, ah, party at barn show, parties that we used to have, you'd sing that at the top of your voice. But look, music's always been part of what I do, but I never ever saw myself as a player or a musician. I, I, um, I sort of come into all sorts of places where I'd sing, but I never ever thought of playing music. I tried to learn to play a guitar. My sister had a guitar and I tried to learn to play, but I couldn't get my right hand to do something different to my left, so I gave it up. <laughs> and, um, but one, when I, the day I turned 40, um, Lou Brennan, a guy that um, ended up on the council with me for many years, um, gave me a harmonica for my birthday and said, here, learn to play this because wow. um, he knew I had a love of blues music and all the rest of it. And I played around with it for a little while and oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But then about a year and a half later, after I'd thrown this thing in the in the cabinet for a while in the drawer, um, we got together one New Year's Eve and got a heap of people sort of singing. And, you know, we decided we might form a band out of it. And if I was going to play an instrument, it's going to have to be the harmonica. So I dragged it back out of the case and... It, the rest is history, you know. So, yeah, my harmonica playing and what I've done then is probably down to Lou in those early days when he sort of got me doing it. I see. Well, you've, you have. You've have. you been on stage with some very, very talented musicians. Um, but you just have a way of just sort of chiming in with what they're doing rather than taking the lead yourself. Has that always been the way you perform? Afraid so. <laughs> it's called my life. Um <laughs> Look, uh, as I said before, my dyslexia has what I think is my dyslexia. I've never been confirmed that's what it is. But it's all about detail. Every, every time I come into something of detail, it takes consistent memory to, to make things work or, or you know, long. My brain just goes into a fuzz when all that stuff happens. And I, um, you know, even phone numbers, I'll find myself ringing someone up that I've rung up all and get the wrong number and I look at the number and I've, I'll have two numbers back to, front. back to front and it just happens to me constantly mm -hmm. so I can't I never got any confidence in myself being able to remember something exactly I can't do that mm -hmm. but what I've got is and Doc Spann once said to me I got excellent tone and excellent timing and I understand the music and I remember him saying to me you you, you don't play blues harmonica you feel it it's all about feel it's all about how you feel it and you don't play blues music with your mouth you play it with your heart so that's what i do and everything i do i interpret it takes me years to learn the vocals of a song. <laughs> that's why they're all really simple four three or four verses done yeah. two choruses for the same um and I played, like I say, I played with some really good bands, a fabulous Green Machine, the guys in that, you know, they're national level players, all of them. Very talented. Know, very history. What great. are you doing in there, Bob? Exactly. <laughs> I pinch myself every time I walk on stage with it, but, you know, Timmy Gase, you know, number 14 guitar player in the country, you know, um, he said, don't worry about it, Bob, we'll fix it. You just keep doing what you're doing. So that's what I am. And I just get out there and... I get a feel for what they're playing. I'll remember a few licks that um, once they start playing that I need to do and I'll know where to put them. But the rest of it, I'm just making it up as I go. Um, and I'm just lucky that I can do that. You know, if I didn't have that ability or didn't have the confidence in myself to to do that, I mean, I'm a guy that can't read music. I mean, I, I, I can't even read the lyrics of a song without going, you know, half the time. But, you know, I've played at the muster, I've played at, Byron Bay, um, Woodford, Darling Harbour, Jazz and Blues, Clownerby Youth Festival, with this band. Stages that people I know that are 10 times as good as me would give their right arm to get on. And here I am doing it. And I don't know what I'm doing, you know. And about, I'm confident in, that I don't know what I'm doing. And well, spe speaking of that confidence, any front man or woman of a band has to have that. A, a band is dead without it. 
is that just externally what's going on or, or internally are you feeling that confidence as well? I know I feel it. Absolutely. Because you can't do that stuff if you're not confident. You can't pretend to be confident. But is there a level of nerves like you're playing with Tim Gaze and some of these great musos? Are you nervous up on stage? When I walk on stage, I pinch myself to make sure I'm not dreaming. <laughs> and I can look at my hands and they'll be shaking. First note, if I looked at my hands, it'd be gone. The shaking's gone. The moment it starts, it's gone. Because I know whatever I do, it's going to work. I've made mistakes. I've forgotten lyrics for songs. And, but the guys can fix all that. But up front, we do a good show. We have fun. And I often introduce the band, say, you know, we're the fabulous screen machine. We're here to have fun. Hope you enjoy it. You know, and... Having fun on stage is the real secret of a good entertainment. If if the band's not having fun on stage, how can you expect people watching it to have fun? And you That's can tell reality. that too, right? Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> Stands out that like the proverbial. But, you know, look, that's all we've ever done. And even with the Strangest Dreamers, the other band I've been playing with, same thing. We just have fun on stage. And if we don't have fun, um, it shows. And uh, look, I'm lucky enough to be able to do that. Um, there's... there's People would kill to do what I do, as I said before, but they don't have the confidence in themselves to get up and do it. I know a, a good friend of mine, no names, no pact, has been playing harmonica for longer than I have. And the thought of getting up on stage and playing in front of people just <laughs> blows him away, blows him out of the water. Did, uh, does, does playing on stage as an entertainer, did it help your political career, do you think? No, I think my political clear actually helped me <laughs> on stage. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to be honest, I I learnt um, not to be fearful on st on stage. I learnt the first time I ever spoke in public, I thought I was going to have a heart attack, mm. you know, and and I wasn't even a politician, and I was a um, a show society conference learning how to manage local agricultural shows, wow. and I got up and asked a question, and there was about sixty people in the room. And I thought I was, you know, the Prime Minister of England just giving him the address <laughs> on, you know, the Battle of London, you know. But I, my whole heart was just yeah. exploding. I was so fearful of what I was doing. But I learnt not to be fearful, and that's given me the power to get on stage. Um, and look, if, there are times when I think, Ooh, I didn't like that. But... Most people don't see it, you know, and you just got to, you just got to be confident in yourself. I, I walk off stage and the guys say, oh, "Great show, Bob." Was it? Oh, thank Christ for that, you know. <laughs> got their approval. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get their approval. Look, no matter what you do when you're on stage, if if you're fearful of what you're doing, don't look at the people in the audience because they'll tell you. Really quick, just look at their eyes. The harshest you know, critics. Absolutely, they're your harshest critics. If they're having fun, just keep doing whatever it is you're doing, you know. And uh, you, you see all sorts of really famous entertainers that just say the same stuff. If you're not entertaining anybody, you're not doing your job, and you just got to be able to do it. And if you don't have confidence, you said ego. People talk about egos. People that do what I do, have to have an ego. If you don't have an ego, you can't do it, you know. But if you use that ego for good instead of for bad, it's not a problem. I, I had a massive ego as a politician. I could get out there and do all that stuff that needed to be done, you know, and make statements that needed to be done that mightn't be popular. Get out there and do it because I was confident in myself to do it. Um, get out there and make statements that, that you knew people were going to love because, yeah, this is beauty, you know. That's right. Um, but at the end of the day, if I didn't have that sort of ego, that sort of power, I learnt to use the word power instead of ego and I learnt to use energy as a replacement for power. So the ego replaces the power and the power creates the energy. So you've got the energy to deliver that stuff. That's what you need. And once the, you understand that power and ego are merely a way of getting the energy that you need to deliver the things you need to do, just simplifies it, you know. Uh, so ego to me is not a dirty word anymore. Power to me is not a dirty word anymore. You know, I was a young man growing up. I thought a powerful person 
It was like the mine owners that used to trash my, you know, mining brethren out the back, you know, and I'm a, I come from a long line of miners. Um, so needless to say, my politics are extremely to the left, but a powerful person was someone that made their life miserable. That's what I saw power. But with, you know, with my partner Sue, it's the latter part of my career, she made me understand that that power is the energy that you have to do your work. You, you create that power around you, gives you the energy, the, the ego that you develop along the way, that confidence that gives you that ego, creates the energy that you need to, to, make, to do the work. And at the end of the day, those things all come together. You can use it for good or you can use it for bad. I was in the perfect position to use it for good and did it. Well, uh, and I think on behalf of the whole Sunshine Coast, including Noosa, that uh, that we're glad that you did. Thank uh, you. Bob Abbott, thanks for the chat today, mate. It's been very interesting and, and very enjoyable. To finish off, we're going to hear some of these tunes. Now, I know without the Tim Gazers and, and the, the, the band behind you, you're a little bit reluctant, but I'm sure there's many people watching that are uh, excited to hear you play some harmonica. All right. Well, as I say, I'll only be making it up and um, no one to hide my mistakes. So <laughs> don't expect anything brilliant, guys. I don't know how to play a song and you won't know what I'm going to play because neither will I. So let let that me. ego take over, Bob. Thanks, mate. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very a lovely good. way to finish. Excellent. Thanks, mate. Bob Babbitt, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Very good.